A married woman from Atlanta, Georgia started receiving flowers from a man that secretly had a crush on her. Just weeks later, that woman went to her car in the parking lot after leaving a shopping center and suddenly disappeared in what would become Atlanta's most infamous disappearance and one of the biggest in the country as well. This is the story of Mary Shotwell Little. On October 14, 1965, in Atlanta, Georgia, a 25-year-old woman named Mary Shotwell Little finished work and went to the Colonial Market to buy some groceries as she planned on having a dinner party tomorrow. After finishing her shopping, she met a colleague at SNS Cafeteria to have dinner. Mary worked as a secretary at a bank called CNS, or Citizens and Southern National Bank, which today is known as Bank of America. America. Mary had also recently married her husband Roy Little and Roy had left town because of his work but he was going to return tomorrow for the dinner party. After Mary and her colleague finished their dinner they began walking around the shopping center looking at the goods on display in the shop windows but they didn't really plan on buying anything. At approximately 8pm Mary decided to leave the shopping center so she said goodbye to her colleague and went went to her car in the parking lot. The following morning, Mary didn't show up at CNS for work. What's even more strange is that she never called her manager to let him know that she wouldn't be present. Mary's manager was obviously very confused, so he contacted her apartment complex and he was able to get in touch with her landlord. The landlord would then go into Mary's apartment complex and she wasn't there. The manager then contacted the shopping center and asked them if they could search for Mary's car. The shopping center then sent out their security guards to search for Mary's car, but they couldn't find it. The manager then went to the parking lot himself and he was able to find Mary's car in that exact location. It turns out that the shopping center security patrolled the parking lot to make sure that no one parked there overnight and if they did, they would be given a ticket. Mary had left the parking lot when the security were patrolling the area and after some time, she returned to the same location. Since her car was never in the parking lot when the security were patrolling it, she was never given a ticket and the security never checked the parking lot again when she returned, which is why they said they didn't see her car. Upon discovering Mary's car in the parking lot, the police were quickly contacted. An examination of the car was soon conducted and the outside of the car was covered in red dust, like the dust you'd find on dirt roads. Inside of the car, there were four bags filled with groceries, a pack of cigarettes, drink bottles, and various clothing items, which included panties, a bra, one stocking, and a girdle. Most of the clothes were on the center console between the driver and passenger seats, nicely folded, but the stocking and the bra were on the car's floor. The stocking appeared to have been deliberately cut with a knife. The underwear belonged to Mary and it looked like it had been used not too long ago. However, Mary's car keys, outer clothing, jewelry, coat and purse were all missing and their whereabouts were yet to be discovered. A thorough investigation of the scene unveiled a horrifying discovery. Droplets of blood were found on the clothing, the steering wheel had blood on it, the area near the driver's door handle had blood on it, the inside of the passenger's window had blood on it, there was even blood on the driver and passenger seats. The blood was later tested and the results of the test indicated there was a high probability that the blood belonged to Mary herself. What's even more strange is that there was only a small volume of blood found in the car, similar to that of a nosebleed, as well as it being in different areas in the car. And this made the authorities question whether this crime scene had been staged or not. 
adding to the mystery, a fingerprint that wasn't Mary's was discovered within the blood on the car's steering wheel. Roy was later informed about Mary's sudden disappearance and he quickly returned to Atlanta on October 15th. From the beginning of the investigation, Roy was always a big suspect. Which makes sense because when someone disappears or is murdered or something bad happens to them, the people that are closest to that person will almost always be questioned first. And in this case, Roy was actually displaying some red flags. It turns out that Roy didn't have a great relationship with Mary's friends. In fact, some of Mary's friends didn't even attend her wedding simply because of Roy's presence. When requested to undergo a polygraph test, Roy refused to do so, not once, but twice. If that wasn't suspicious, Roy seemed to be more concerned with the return of his vehicle from the laboratory, where forensic experts were analyzing his wife's blood samples, rather than Mary herself. However, he did take note of the car's mileage and discovered a discrepancy of 40 unexplained miles on the odometer. In a subsequent interview, Roy recounted an encounter he and Mary had with another CNS employee in Chattanooga, Tennessee in a hotel before Mary disappeared. According to Roy, the colleague had this cold and distant attitude towards them. Mary Mary believed that the man's strange behavior was due to some kind of trouble he had gone into at CNS. Although Mary was aware of the specific details, she chose not to disclose them to Roy. And Roy didn't really care that much at the time, so he didn't bother asking Mary to explain everything to him. As the search for Mary continued on October 15th, something very unusual occurred. Mary's credit card had been used in Charlotte, North Carolina at an Esso gas station. 12 hours after this incident, the same card was used at a different Esso gas station in Raleigh, North Carolina. The credit slips had what looked like Mary's signature on it and workers at both of these gas stations recounted encountering a woman that had minor head injuries and blood stains on both her legs and head. This woman was was accompanied by one or possibly two unshaven men that appeared to be middle-aged and seemed to be in control of her. The woman tried obscuring her face from the workers and refrained from signaling or seeking assistance. Further investigation revealed that the North Carolina license plate number recorded on the credit slips had been reported stolen just days before Mary had suddenly disappeared. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. What really confused the investigators was that Mary's credit card had been used twice within a 12 hour interval and Charlotte was Mary's hometown and Raleigh was just a 2 to 3 hour drive away. The relatively short distance between these two areas raised questions about the time elapsed between the initial and subsequent use of the card and that just added another layer of strangeness to this mystery. On October 16th, two days after Mary went missing, an investigator in the Atlanta Police Department contacted hospitals in the vicinity to find out if Mary had admitted herself to any one of them. But no traces of her presence were found within any of these hospitals. On October 17th, three days after Mary went missing, Roy told an investigator assigned to the case that he had gotten this unexpected phone call from a man named Calvin Allen who expressed his heartfelt prayers and condolences regarding Mary's disappearance. But the thing is, Roy didn't know who this mysterious Calvin Allen was and he never even talked to this person before. On October 18th, Four days after Mary went missing, the Atlanta Police Department urged residents living within 20 miles of the shopping center to thoroughly inspect their properties for any signs of Mary's personal belongings or possibly her remains. 
Following the public disclosure of the credit slips, Roy would find himself on the receiving end of a ransom call demanding a hefty sum of $20,000. The mysterious caller directed Roy to make his way to an overpass situated in the serene surroundings of the Pisgah National Forest in western North Carolina in order to discover additional instructions posted on a sign. An FBI agent was dispatched to the designated location on Roy's behalf and all he discovered was a blank piece of paper taped to the sign, leaving him confused and without any useful leads. Whoever this caller was never reached out to Roy or any of Mary's relatives again and this led the FBI to swiftly conclude that the call was likely just a hoax. Another strange incident like this occurred when the authorities received a phone call by an anonymous man who claimed to know who Mary's killer was and the location of her body. The caller gave the police the location and claimed that this 40 year old man was responsible for her murder. Police were quickly dispatched to the location but there was nothing there and there was no evidence that supports the caller's claims and we don't know if Mary was actually murdered or not. As the investigation went on, a woman who was present at the shopping centre on the night of Mary's disappearance stepped forward. According to her testimony, she found herself in a distressing encounter with an unidentified man as she was about to enter her vehicle. Vehicle. Sensing potential danger, she quickly locked her door and would not open it, even though whoever this man was told her that she had a flat tire. Overwhelmed by fear, she quickly drove away and then stopped at a nearby service station. She got out of her car, checked her tires, and contrary to what the man told her, they were perfectly fine. The woman said that this strange encounter occurred just before 8pm, which coincided with the time when Mary said goodbye to her colleague and headed towards her vehicle in the parking lot. Despite extensive efforts, law enforcement couldn't find this man or any individuals who might have encountered him at the shopping centre, not only on the night of Mary's disappearance, but on other occasions as well. During the course of the investigation, close friends of Mary came forward with accounts of disturbing phone calls they had been receiving at their workplace in the weeks preceding Mary's disappearance. These calls added another layer of strangeness to the case, as Mary had told this unidentified caller that she she had a husband and could no longer meet with him or her, yet they were welcome to visit her instead. Additionally, it came to light that Mary had been receiving flowers from an anonymous secret admirer during the same period as the phone calls. Although the flowers were traced back to a local florist near Mary's home, the identity of the purchaser could not be found. Mary had chosen to keep these unsettling phone calls and the mysterious flowers to herself, withholding the details from anyone in her circle. Mary's friends also revealed that she had developed a great sense of fear and unease when it came to being alone or even driving by herself. Despite their concerns, Mary never disclosed the reasons behind these unsettling feelings. Adding to the mystery, a few days before she went missing, Mary told her colleagues that she wanted to tell them something very important, yet she never revealed to them what it was. This case had just simply gone cold. Fast forward to May 19th, 1967, a year and a half after Mary disappeared, another tragic incident unfolded involving a 22-year-old woman named Diane Shields who happened to work in the same bank. Diane was last spotted leaving the bank driving her distinctive blue and white Chevrolet Impala. 
The following day at 2.30 a.m., Diane's car was discovered near a laundromat on Sylvan Road in Atlanta. Inside the trunk, authorities discovered Diane's lifeless body. Diane was fully dressed, wasn't essayed, and her diamond engagement ring remained on her finger. The cause of the death was determined to be suffocation as a scarf had been forcefully inserted into her throat. An investigation was conducted and the authorities discovered that in November 1965, a year and a half before Diane was murdered, Diane found herself living alone in her apartment after her roommate had moved out. One evening, an unfamiliar man appeared at her door, posing as a book salesman. This man repeatedly tried entering Diane's apartment and he said to her that he knew her roommate had moved out recently and Diane was now living by herself. Diane, who was now terrified, quickly contacted the police, but when the police arrived, the man had vanished. In June 1966, around a year before Diane was murdered, Diane had relocated to a new residence on Tim Valley Road, sharing the place with several roommates. Among them was Judy, who had previously lived with Mary until her marriage with Roy in September 1965, and Judy worked at CNS. Diane had recently ended a relationship with a colleague from CNS, which had really taken a toll on her mental health. During this difficult period, she became extremely depressed and ingested a significant number of sleeping pills, but luckily she survived. Diane also had a tendency to venture out on her own without informing anyone of her whereabouts or what time she would return. Additionally, in a conversation with Gail Husbands, her childhood friend, Diane Shields disclosed her involvement with the police in attempting to unravel the mystery surrounding Mary's disappearance. The timing of Diane's tragic murder occurring shortly after she had occupied the same position as Mary appeared to be more than a mere coincidence. However, there was no definitive evidence or conclusive information that proves that that there was a direct connection between Diane's murder and Mary's disappearance. While police initially speculated on a possible link due to their similarities and their shared workplace, the theory was eventually discarded. Just like Mary's case, despite all the leads the law enforcement received, they just led to dead ends and Diane's case went cold. The investigation into Mary Shotwell Little's disappearance and Diane Shields' murder is ongoing and both cases continue to be unresolved mysteries.